Hi guys, this is Andrew with headphones.com. Welcome to the Headphone Show, and today we're going to talk all about EQ. Now, I know there's some resistance to the notion of doing EQ. I see you guys in the comments. You guys don't like when headphones benefit from EQ or require EQ to sound great, especially over a certain price point. I'm not expecting anybody to change their minds about EQ. I know there's some purists out there who just like never touch it, never bother with EQ. You know, only hardware, that's it. So I'm not expecting everybody to just magically start learning how to do EQ and get into the whole process. I just want to give you guys a little bit of perspective about why I do EQ and why other people might also be doing EQ as well. So the first thing I want to do is clear up a little bit of confusion on the subject. I think there's a lot of people that think that when you do use EQ, you're introducing some sort of digital processing artifacts. And I want to let you guys know that if you're, as long as you're doing it correctly, that should never happen. Uh, if you think about it, unless you're using a turntable <laughs> or just are strictly analog for everything, at some point you're doing some digital to analog conversion. There's already something going on with, com with the computer or the device that you're playing it from that is a digital component to this. Now, with that said, I have noticed that in some cases, if you have a certain type of software, uh, like a virtual audio cable, uh, it can actually loop the signal and then it can resample this and you do start to get some digital artifacting in there. And so that's why I say, as long as you've done it correctly, you know, with Equalizer APO or something like that, or maybe you're using Rune, uh, this should never be, this shouldn't be a problem. This should not show up. Of course, the nice thing with something like Rune is that you can run it in exclusive mode and still use the digital signal processing, the EQ that's built into Rune. Now, the other consideration is that it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, at least not the easiest thing to do correctly. And I'm going to show you guys the process for how I do it. But before doing that, I also want to take a moment to recognize the other reasons why you might not want to do EQ. The first is if the headphone can't handle it. So if a headphone starts to distort or it starts to sound weird because of, you know, it introduces a problem or a resonance or something that didn't exist there before, uh, you know, that that's totally a, a reason not to do EQ. Um, generally, head, uh, planar magnetic headphones and electrostatic headphones will have a much easier time with EQ, uh, but a lot of dynamic driver headphones are totally fine with this as well. The main exceptions are things like the HD6XX from Sennheiser, 650, 660S, etc. They don't really respond all that well to EQ. The other consideration I think that's worth keeping in mind is that the hobby is a lot of fun when you don't EQ. It's almost more fun if you don't EQ. Um, and then it really matters which headphones you have because you're not able to change the frequency response. If you're, if you're just saying, I'm never doing this EQ thing, the, the, the frequency response of the headphones that you have matters so much more, right? The, the, the variations that you get and the different flavors of headphones, the different types of sound that you get, it matters so much more. And so there's an extra kind of fun component to that, which I think it's worth taking into consideration. It's worth respecting that to a certain degree. But... The reason, the main reason why I like to do EQ is there are so many headphones, even the crazy high-end ones, that I think can benefit from EQ. So far in my experience, I have yet to come across a headphone that can't be improved uh, even just a little bit uh, with, with EQ. And for the purists out there, I tend to agree with you. I would rather not have to do EQ or not be inclined to do EQ. Um, but there's so much advantage that you can get for the headphones to sound good. Um, if you are comfortable doing it, if you do you know, want to figure this out a little bit. Even if something perfectly matches the Harman target, it'll probably sound pretty good. Because I, I think that uh, especially the 2013 Harman target sounds pretty good. Um, even if it matches that, that might not line up with your preference. Because remember that those targets, they're all preference based. They're all consumer preference curves. So if you want it to, you know, if that's normalized and you see it measuring flat and it measures really well, Oh, that's great. The Hi-Fi Men Sundara measures fantastically well, uh, at least the, the latest one. But that's going to be relative to a given target curve that's based on consumer preference, if it's Harman at least. Um, and so if you have a different preference, if you want more bass, if you want less bass, in my case I want less bass than the 2018 target, but I kind of like where it's at on the 2013 target. Uh, or if you want more treble, if you don't want the, the Harman treble roll off, for example, you know you can have something that deviates a little bit from what people think of as flat, if they see it on the graph there, uh, and have it be perfectly, you know, what they want. And so, if you want to get the most out of the headphones that you own, for what your preference is, you know, when you're when you're wearing them, not the way that they measure on a graph, right? There's feeling good about something measuring well on a graph and being confident in the purchase, and then there's what you actually personally enjoy. And I think it's worth considering that last 
aspect. Consider what you actually want to hear. Consider where you want your base level to be. Do you want it to be what measures flat on a given target? That's really something only you can decide for yourself. And for me, I love the technical aspects of high-end headphones. I love the detail retrieval that you get from the Odyssey LCD X. I love the punch and slam. I love the planar instrument separation and image clarity and all of these qualities from the LCD X. But I don't like its frequency response all that much. I think there's a severe dip there in the upper mid-range. And so in order for me to enjoy this headphone to its fullest potential, to what the, the rest of its technical aspects are capable of doing, it requires diving into EQ. It requires getting, figuring out how to use EQ a little bit and making some of these adjustments. Okay, so let's take a look at how we can EQ the Odyssey LCD X. Of course, you don't have to use this target curve, but I do find it to be generally agreeable. Uh, I do post measurements on headphones.com and in the community forum there uh, that has a different target. So if you're looking for how this measures relative to a different target, maybe something with a little bit more flat bass or with a little bit more treble or something like that, check out the community forum thread there and see if this is something that I've already posted. So the purple line here is how the Odyssey LCD X measures relative to the dotted line. And the dotted line, of course, is the uh, 2013 Harman target. The one important thing to keep in mind with what we're trying to do here is we're trying to give the Odyssey LCD X a little bit more of an appropriate uh, response in the area where our ear gain would be impacting the frequency response that we'd be hearing. So once again, the reason why this dotted line, this target sounds good with this elevation here starting at around 1k is because we have ears and our ears amplify certain frequencies and it happens to line up fairly closely with the way that this preference curve ends up going. Essentially, our brain corrects for this elevation that our ears impart to the sound that we receive. And so when we hear something that has this elevation, uh, it, it gets normalized and we hear that as normal. The flip side, of course, is that when we hear something like the Odyssey LCD X here, uh, without any EQ, where it dips quite significantly after 1K, between 1K and, you know, 4.5K, it won't sound all that normal because it doesn't properly match the gain factors that our ears have. So by contrast, this sounds quite muted and muffled. So what does this mean? This means that when we're doing EQ, we can try and get it closer to this target, and then it'll a little bit more closely match the way that we normally hear the world. Because once again, our brains are correcting for the elevation that is imparted by the physical shape to our ears that amplify certain frequencies, and when it doesn't get that signal, it's going to sound muffled and muted by comparison. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at the deviations for the purple frequency response and try and match it as closely as we can to the target, to the Harman target here, the dotted line. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is that we're going to try and do this as conservatively as possible. So when we see something like this crazy dip here at around 4.2k, this isn't something that I'm going to try and perfectly match to this target. And in fact, we're actually going to try and go a little bit conservative and a little bit shy of this target. You know, with headphones and doing EQ, I'd rather make it as easy as possible and use as wide Q values, effectively making it so that the adjustments that we make here are adjusting as wide a range as possible. And we'll get into that. I just want to also make a quick note that I'm using this graph here to guide my EQ, but it's also important to use your ears and make sure that everything sounds okay uh, because you don't just want to, you know, try and match the target and then be done. Uh, you, you know, you got to use your ears and make sure this actually sounds good at the end of the day as well because that's what's most important. I also want to mention that this LCDX in particular is the one, is the latest one that has the mesh grill. Uh, so, you know, if you have a previous LCDX or an older one and you want to do this EQ, it may be a little bit different from the one that I am showing you guys here. Uh, you may end up needing to be a little bit more conservative than this one. So I personally use Equalizer APO to do the EQ. This is a system-wide EQ, and I really like it for that reason. But you can use any other software that you'd like. If you'd rather do this in Rune, that's fine. Just keep in mind that when you're doing your EQ in Rune, uh, you won't be doing it system-wide. It'll only be for the tracks that get played by Rune. And I know some of you guys out there use Apple, and I'm not sure that this would be the way to do it on Apple, but there are likely to be other equalizer programs that you can use for Apple as well. Um, and once again, Rune is something that you can use uh, for your music. Um, and I actually find the Rune's software 
uh, runes dsp is even better than this it's actually way easier to do uh, but i'll show you the type of curve that you're going to apply to the, the purple frequency response target for the lcd x here so the first thing i'm going to do is add a base shelf at 120 hertz why because if you look at right at around 120 hertz roughly that's where the base starts to deviate from the target a little bit um, right so we want the base to be a little bit higher up here like that and when you add a base shelf it does that for you the nice thing about doing it this way is that you don't have to adjust individual peak filters here these little blue uh, mountain looking things it's called peak filters for a reason uh, instead we use this filter here which is the red one that adds the base shelf and we adjust it by 3 db uh, the second thing I do is I dip this section here, so anywhere from yeah, 120 up to uh, 386. Now I use a fairly wide Q value here, so it just dips the whole range. So I've taken it down by 2 dB, and this number here, that is your Q value, that is how wide a frequency range or how narrow a frequency range you're going to be adjusting, and I leave it at 1.41 to make it reasonably wide so that this whole range gets dipped. And I'll show you guys the frequency response after EQ as well. Uh, the next thing that I do is I drop 700 hertz as well. That's this bump here. I'm just going to move this over here. Again, at 700 hertz, I'm making the EQ a little bit narrower, but still fairly wide. Anything below two is fairly wide. And then the more significant adjustments start to happen at around uh, above 1K. Uh, so we'll take a look at what we've done here at 1700 hertz. Again, at a fairly wide Q value, I've boosted things by 3.5. And then at 3200, I've boosted things by 7 at a 1.5 Q value, so also fairly wide. Uh, and then at 4200, I've boosted things by 6 uh, with a little bit of a narrower Q value. And that's mostly because of this section here. I've tried to get it up a little bit more specifically, but you can adjust this in any way that you want to get it to uh, to, to fill in this, this range. Uh, I find this is more significantly recessed than the top part of where the curve is. Here you get about a 9 or 10 dB deviation, whereas down here it's significantly more. Now you might be asking yourself, why am I adjusting this by only 7 and 6 and 3.5? rather than the 10 and 9 dB that the deviation shows. And the reason for that is actually because these affect each other. So this is actually the curve that ends up getting applied after EQ. Um, and when you adjust individual ranges here, they also affect the ranges around them that you've already adjusted. So there is a slight compounding effect that goes on here. They don't adjust independently. Um, if you think about it, it makes sense. If you adjust 1700 by 3.5 dB, if you give it a boost, then plus 7 at 3200 is going to be plus 7 there, but depending on how wide the Q value is, it's also going to affect the lower range and the higher range as well. So that's why I've gone with slightly lower values here than what the deviation actually shows. And really what you've got to do is you've got to look at this curve that gets applied, just so you know that's this button here. So you got to look at this curve that gets applied uh, to the frequency response to know how it's actually changing, not the individual values that you've input here, uh, because those are also going to be impacting one another. Now, what I've done at 5.5k hertz is I've dropped it there a bit. And if you look at the frequency response, the purple line here again, that's this area here. So I've tried to smooth out that peak a little bit. I don't think it's, again, as necessary to completely drop this, but trying to make it a little bit less uh, noticeable is probably a good thing. And then this this last one that I've done here at 9.5k hertz, I think is optional. That's this section down here. And I've boosted this here in the CQ, but I've tried it both with and without the 9.5k hertz boost. I don't think it's necessary because you don't hear the dip here as significantly um, just because the ranges around it are substantially elevated by comparison. Now, the last thing that you're going to see here is there's quite a bit of air above 12k hertz. Uh, and like 12k, 11k, 12k and above. And I think that this target here, personally, I think this target rolls off a little bit in the treble. So I don't really drop this all that much. I do drop it relative to everything else. So I add a dip there at around 11.6k hertz with a fairly narrow Q value to kind of drop this top little piece here. Um, and then, you know, after that, uh, I think it's probably okay. Uh, the next resonance that you hear 
at least on this rig, shows up at 16.7k or 16.5k hertz, basically. And most people aren't going to actually hear that. Um, you could drop it if it's something that really bugs you, um, but I find it's not a problem, uh, not even a little bit. Um, this 12k hertz one, for some people, I think might be a bit much, so you could go a little bit more down at around, yeah, like 11.5k hertz. But for me, I don't really mind it all that much. I like a little bit of extra sparkle there for the air, and it makes the splash and sizzle come through a little bit more. Keep in mind, this is not as crazy elevated as something like the LCD-4 in this range specifically, at least on this unit. And that's the other interesting thing is that maybe on other units, this might show up a little bit more strongly, or you know you might notice this peak here a little bit more strongly as well. Now, once we've done the EQ here, we also have to take down the pre-amplifying so that we're not clipping anywhere. I just go by whatever the highest value is here. It should probably actually be whatever the highest value it ends up showing up on this section here. Um, so we could probably go even further than what I've done. I've done negative seven, but it, it could probably be negative 10, um, just so that you avoid clipping. Um, also keep in mind that this is going to be reflected in the volume, in your digital volume for your system as well. So if that's lower, then that's also going to prevent clipping as well. Now, looking at what we've put together here, what does the frequency response for the LCD X look like after this gets applied? All right, let me just show you this here. So the purple one is the original measurement of the LCD-X. This is actually an averaged uh, response. Uh, that's why it looks a little bit odd in the base there um, because I tried to take measurements from different seating positions to try and get you know the, the, the average. But after the EQ gets applied, this is what the frequency response ends up looking like, the, the orange line here. Um, once again, this base stuff here, um, I don't think it's actually like this. This is just because it's averaged. And sometimes, you know, when you break the seal, it drops the base. So that's, I think, why that shows up there. But in general, this has gotten it a lot closer to the target that we're aiming for here. Um, and I'll just remove the purple line here. So this is something that I would consider a reasonably well measuring headphone. Yeah, maybe it's still a little bit much air quality there, but this is again, I think a preference thing. You could drop this more significantly if you wanted to. Um, but once again, we're trying to go with as conservative values as we possibly can. And I think with this EQ applied, this headphone actually sounds pretty good. Now you could go a little bit further. You could boost this 3K by a little bit more, 3.2K a little bit more. But once again, there's a risk that if you do this, you're going to you're going to potentially introduce some up, you know upper mid range shout there. And I actually found that when I was initially doing my EQ, I did have this match the target a little bit more closely here. And I found that I just didn't enjoy it as much. I, I think I preferred it a little bit more relaxed at around 3K Hertz. Um, so this is just where I left it, but I think you can be a little bit more uh, aggressive than I was here in this re in this region. It's just that this, this on its own is significantly better than the default tonality here. And once again, this is a headphone that on its own by default measures quite poorly, um, or at least relative to this target. Um, and then when you EQ it, um, just through the ones that I've done here, it ends up following this quite closely. And I think this sounds really, really good. Um, and then this means that all the information that was missing there at like 3K, uh, at 2K, 3K, and 4K is now present. And you're able to hear all the detail come through a little bit more clearly. Um, so this really helps for clarity, for overall clarity, I find. Um, and it doesn't have that muted and muffled sound because once again, this is the type of sound that our brains are expecting because this is the frequency range that gets amplified by our physical ears. Uh, and so when it's there, it's going to sound a lot more clear. Now, I'm not going to say that the Harman target is perfectly matching what our ears uh, the, the frequencies that our ears amplify with this elevation, because remember that this is a preference curve. This is not based on, you know, what those different gain factors are. The methodology for achieving this curve is totally different, but I do find that there is a loose correlation between this elevation here and, you know, the way that our brains expect to hear things. So you don't have to like the Harman target and you can say, nope, that's not for me, um, that's fine. But I think this is a good starting point for figuring out where next to EQ things, you know, maybe you wanna drop the treble a little bit or drop the bass to make it a little bit more linear or something like that, or get rid of this, you know, uh, lower mid-range dip here. 
to make it be a little bit more linear. That's fine too. Um, this is just, I think, a, a decent starting point to get this headphone to sound really, really good. And so I do think it's worth being critical of a headphone's tonality and frequency response if it's not very good, if it doesn't match a target that you like or what you think is optimal for clarity, etc. But I also think it's worth looking at what a headphone can potentially sound like with EQ. And so for that reason, I think if you want to get the most out of your, especially for high-end headphones, if you want to get the most out of this stuff, I think it's worth considering. Yeah, stay as conservative as possible with EQ. You know, don't try and match the target perfectly. Just make small adjustments and just see how much that makes you enjoy the headphones more. You know, I often talk about it's difficult to compare detail retrieval between headphones where one headphone is significantly dipped in one area and it sounds almost muted and muffled. But then when you EQ it, the detail retrieval ends up being pretty close. A lot of that is just the information just isn't there because the frequency response dips so crazily. Now, we'll be publishing measurements from the Gross measurement system uh, for all the headphones that come through, and I'll be publishing them on headphones.com. There will be a database there, uh, and, and I'm also going to be doing, for some of them, my EQ profiles that are going to be based on these measurements that I'm taking. And so if you just want the easy adjustments and you don't want to actually try making the adjustments yourself, stay tuned to headphones.com, the, the, the reviews and blog page. That's where I'll be posting this stuff. Um, and you can also check out the community forum there. I'll probably be posting all of my EQ profiles and the measurements there in advance in the various different threads that exist for the given headphones that we're talking about. Uh, but anyways, that does it for this video and I will see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.